Good evening, welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. My name is Sarah Brown Anson. I'm going to be the moderator tonight. Our workshop is called Achieving Affordability with Clean Energy. This workshop is part of the forum called Housing is a Human Right, We Can Make It Happen. The forum was organized by Green and Greenfield and Franklin County continuing the political revolution to address our housing crisis. This workshop is the ninth of nine workshops, the last. However, our work will continue and we invite you to be involved in future discussion and action on this topic. Our workshop tonight will focus on affordable, available and high quality housing as a solution to our climate crisis. Through this lens, we will continue the forum's discussion about how we can create a community that offers safe and affordable homes, homes that are accessible to all, regardless of economic status, the color of our skin, physical abilities, gender and sexual orientation. Spencer, one of the presenters, tonight and I have sat on the organizing committee for this forum for the last two years and I have learned a lot. I now have a much deeper understanding of how our government's policies, corporations and the financial system in which we operate have all contributed to making housing hard to find and expensive. In the keynote workshop, we learned from Gina Govoni of the Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority and Rural Development Inc. that we need 1,200 more units now to meet Franklin County's needs. And in three short years, the shortage will grow to 2,500 units. Keynote speaker, UMass professor Bryant Sargent reviewed how people of color were left out or blatantly discriminated against over and over by our government and private developers. The workshop on a corporate capitalist society highlighted how housing has become a commodity, an investment for those of us with access to capital. The eight previous workshops have all discussed important topics related to housing in our area, both import important problems and possible solutions. Starting in 2019, I attended a series of workshops organized by the Massachusetts Climate Action Network entitled Affordable Housing as a Climate Change Solution. These workshops were what inspired me to organize the workshop tonight with Spencer. There I learned that those with a lower income pay a higher percentage on average for housing and utility costs and often have a less comfortable living space in spite of paying these high costs. I also learned that by addressing our housing crisis and giving people access to good housing, we can also address the climate crisis at the same time. Today, we have three amazing speakers to share their expertise and experiences with us. Beverly Craig from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, Jane Carbone from the Homeowners Rehab Inc., and Spencer Shorkey, who owns a home in Miller's Falls. If you have a question during the presentations, please feel free to write the question in the chat box and we will try to find the time to answer it um, after each presentation but you'll have another uh, opportunity to ask questions uh, because after everyone has spoken, we will divide into breakout discussion rooms and that will give you another chance to ask questions or make comments. So now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Beverly Craig. Bev manages the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center's low and moderate income programs, including the Passive House Design Challenge for Affordable Housing the Affordable Clean Residential Energy Program, and the Triple Decker Design Challenge. Bev comes from a background of energy efficiency retrofits and installing renewables at a nonprofit Homeowners Rehab Inc. She holds a BA from the University of Southern California and an MPP from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. All right, over to you, Bev. Just gonna get the slides up. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome, thanks for coming tonight. It's such a beautiful night. I'm really impressed that <laughs> everybody came. Uh, but I just, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some programs for the Mass Safe program that not everybody's aware of. And we just wanna make sure people know and use those if, if 
if they're eligible or spread the word to others who might know it. Next slide, please. So when you live in a home or you're renting in a home, really the first focus of everything should be focusing on making your home more efficient and less drafty. So uh, you really want to focus on improving the insulation and drafts. So just to give some perspective, most existing homes are seven or eight times more drafty than new construction would be. And that's actually probably a bigger piece of most people's bills is that draftiness than even the insulation levels. Um, so the first thing we all need to do is focus on making things more airtight and more insulated. And then really you need to try and improve things by about 30%. And then uh, to meet state climate goals, we're going to need to start getting fossil fuels out of our heating. And that means moving over to electric uh, efficient heat pumps. And I think Spencer's going to be talking about ground source and there's also air source. And I'll talk about some details here as we get going. But um, you want to do all that, make the envelope of your home, like the roof and the basement and the walls as insulated and airtight as first before you start looking at uh, renewable energy. Uh, Solar is a great thing, but you want to start with the building first. Next slide, please. And so just backing up, uh, for this, the state has recently passed a climate law that has a goal of getting us to net zero by 2050. And that means huge changes in our building stock. So right now, buildings are 27% of the greenhouse gases in the state. And you know, transportation is the biggest slice of the pie, but this is the second biggest piece. And so we have basically 80% of the buildings that are here today are going to be here in 2050. So we need to make them much more efficient and get fossil fuels out of them. Next slide, please. And um, the Mass Safe program does have uh, for income qualified customers, a number of programs, and a lot of people don't always know about this. So if you live in, a, if you are a renter or if you are an owner of a single family home, um, if, if you're below 60% of state median income, and I'll show you exactly what that means on the next page, uh, you're eligible for a lot of really great benefits and you should look into it. And then if you live in a bigger multifamily building, so five units or more, um, also, if there's more than half of the tenants are below this, this income level, then there's really generous be benefits through the Mass Save program. Next slide. And one, one thing is that people often don't realize is once they're retired, even if uh, you know, the, their income, their annual income is what shows as uh, income qualified. And so unless you have a very generous pension, a lot of seniors do qualify for the income qualified programs that are out there. Um, and what does that mean? It means you can get a discount rate on your electricity of around 29%. It varies from different parts of the state. Um, you can also get, an, if you sign up for community solar, there's also a income qualified community solar, which would give you another 20% off of your electricity. There is a fuel assistance program that can hit, help pay for some of your heating bills in the winter. And then really generous benefits on this insulation, 100% of it, 100% of air sealing measures, potentially even replacing old refrigerators or uh, dryers. And if you are on oil or electric re resistance heat, the Mass Save program now can sometimes pay for you to get heat pumps, which are these efficient electric heat pumps that both cool and heat. Next slide. And so this is what the 60% of, of, of state median income, this is what it counts for for different household size. So it, it is sliding depending on how many people are in your household. But if you're below this on an annual level, you would be eligible for those very generous benefits. The way to qualify for those is to, I have a link here for the, you know, I, it, there's different communities you guys live in and you'll have a, a, what's called a community action um, provider in your area and you would uh, call them to set up an appointment for income qualification. Next slide. So um, I think I mentioned 
they they can do a lot of this and they'll do it actually direct to install so you don't have to go out and find a contractor they'll come and do it for you with people that they use high volume on so they get better pricing next slide and even if you aren't income qualified uh if you are a renter or an owner mass save will come in and do a free energy assessment for you and will pay for 75 percent of the insulation um so mass save is really good at doing some sort of basic things but when i was mentioning how drafty your home can be one of the things they're not real strong on right now is identifying those drafts next slide um so again this is sort of the different things that those in the income qualified can get for free next slide and even if you are not income qualified um, there is a 0% heat loan that is available for anyone who gets one of these mass save assessments. So say you want to upgrade to heat pumps, you can get this 0% heat loan to help uh, finance that. Or if you need to do, if you have single paned windows and you want to replace them with double paned, there's a whole like category of things that have to do with energy efficiency and improving it that you can finance through these 0% loans. Next slide. And then solar. So solar is something a lot of people think of as, you know, only wealthy people can afford, but actually the um, payback on solar. So solar has gotten so much less expensive over the last 10 years. And uh, it's, it's often, if you invest in it yourself, like take out a loan for it um, for 10 years, it can often pay back in seven or eight years. And that means that you get the rest of the electricity for the next 15 years, basically for free. And it's pretty common that if you even borrow for um, for this, that the cash flow, so the, the money that you're making by not buying from the grid and the money uh, that you get in incentives from the state will, um, it's often cash flow positive, which means you're, you're your the loan payment that you would be making on a 10 10 year loan is less than the benefit that you're getting so uh it's definitely something to look into and um there are federal tax credits as well that help make this even more uh, beneficial 26 percent federal tax credit so if you have enough income that you can write that off um then a thousand dollar state tax credit and just for perspective a lot of these are around uh, $20,000 for a lot of PV systems for a roof to run a home. And, um, but when you take out those tax credits, it, you're down in your like around 15,000. And then you take out a loan for that. And then the loan payments, like I said, are often less than the benefit you get. And if you're looking for a solar provider, we do recommend either going to our, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center's PV page, where you can see who does the highest volume in your area at the lowest cost or going to energy sage which will give you multiple proposals for your home next slide. So we've talked about making your home more efficient and adding renewable energy and then the hardest part is getting the fossil fuels out and so how many of you have heard of heat pumps before do I just raise hands oh wow you guys are great. <laughs> You already know what you're talking about. So a heat pump sort of like this magic technology, but actually all of us have one right now, which is our refrigerator. Uh, if you've ever felt the back of your fridge or maybe the bottom, it is rejecting heat in the inside and pulling it outside. So that's what a heat pump does. And the, the thing that's different about it is it can be reversed in, in either an air source heat pump, which takes heat from the outside in the winter and sort of moves it to the inside. And the other way is true during the summer. It moves the heat from the inside and moves it outside. Um, and they, cold climate heat pumps work great in our climate. They go all the way to negative 15. If your home is well insulated and where, well air sealed, then going to total heat pumps is very, very reasonable. Next slide. Oh, keep going. That's a compressor. So that's what it sort of looks like. And then this is a ground source heat pump. And Spencer, I think, has one. So he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and that uses basically, it's even more efficient than that using the air to bring the heat to the house because the ground, under the ground, 
uh, you know, when you go down a little ways, it's much more temperate. It doesn't get as cold or as hot. Next slide. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what I did on my house so you can sort of see perspective. So I live in a two family. Uh, I have the second and third floor of this building and it's a condo. And uh, when I first moved in, I didn't know my neighbor downstairs. And so when Mass Safe came, I could only do the things that I could control in my unit, which is see the roof line is pitched. So at the knee walls, which is the, the sort of side, the third floor is, is finished and the sides have a knee wall, which I insulated when I first came in. And so they paid 75% of that. So I think I, I just, did, I paid like maybe, I didn't pay very much at all. I don't remember how much it was, but it wasn't much. But then three years later, I got to know my neighbor downstairs better and we insulated the walls together. So if you're in a two family, you can't insulate the walls just yourself because it would just slide down to the first floor, right? So uh, we went into Mass Save together, did that and uh, it was an amazing deal. So now they do this for free actually in multifamilies, the wall insulation and any insulation actually. But at that time we got $12,000 worth of cellulose insulation in the walls for $500 a piece. And then um, I was not able to put solar on my roof because my condo mate didn't want it. But what I did do is purchase 100% renewable energy. So I live in Newton and they have an ag a municipal aggregation that lets me opt up to 100%, but there's plenty of other options. I mentioned community solar, that's one way to go. Um, and there's also plenty of other providers that provide uh, renewable energy for your electricity. Next slide. And then I mentioned air infiltration. So MassSave was not, they've been in twice to my house and they've never mentioned anything about air sealing. And that was a big problem in my home. So I had recessed lights um, on my third floor and it's a finished third floor. And also in my kitchen outside the roof, uh, under the roof line. And what that meant is those 12 recessed lights had air gushing through them from the outside all the time in the winter. And I also had a num I have two unheated porches and uh, the doors going out to them had horrible, they just, you know, lots of air. You can tell when you got close to them that they were really cold in the winter. And so I put in uh, airtight recessed lights, which uh, is easy to do and not that expensive. They also, there are also retrofit kits now that allow for you to do that. So a recessed light between like a, a heated floor and another heated floor doesn't matter at all. But if it's going to the outside of the house, it does matter a lot. And um, I also put in, I have uh, skylights, which, also gush a ton of air. So I did, I could, again, I couldn't get my condo mate to change, let me change that, but she did, uh, you know, I could put blinds on. So I put uh, thermal insulated blinds um, and that's really nice. The other thing that I did is in my kitchen, I have a gas stove and it's not that old. Um, so a lot of people love when they redo kitchens to go to induction stoves, which is using sort of magnetic resonance to cook your food. Like all the chefs love that. And honestly, the foodies who redo their kitchen do use this. It's much more precise than gas and it does really great with low temperatures. So what I did instead was I bought this $50 um, countertop unit and I, I probably only use my, my stove top 20% of the time. The rest of the time I use this one. Um, and then uh, I had a 12 year old Prius. My son moved to Vermont and needed it a car. So I gave him my Prius and I bought an electric vehicle, which I gotta say is so awesome. <laughs> They're fun to drive. I got $10,000 off because um, there's a 7,500 tax credit and you get a rebate of 2,500 from the state. So I, I bought a Nissan Leaf. There's so many have come out in this, this spring. There's a lot of options, even for car types that didn't used to have them like SUVs. And I love that I don't have nearly as much maintenance. That's the thing about electric vehicles is they have about 22 moving parts, but a, a gas car has about 220. So you have to service, you know, you have to get oil changes and transmission, all these things on a regular car. I don't have to do any of that. And then my car will probably last a lot longer too. Next slide. And then, oh, wow, this slide got a little crazy. <laughs> The pictures seem to have, have turned, but um, I did just this year invest in heat pumps. So now I'm heating and cooling with heat pumps. And then I'm using 
renewable energy to run those. So um, I'm getting closer to net zero, not all the way there. Next slide. And one more, uh, Jane's gonna be next, but I wanted to mention one more thing that if you guys are active in your community, one thing that's coming up quickly is um, the, if you know policymakers, so elected officials, planning department staff, or energy commission, um, we're trying to get people to go to a June 11th uh, forum about zero energy buildings. And there'll be a lot of very specific things that municipalities, people in municipalities can pass as uh, ordinances or as a condition of special permits that will address both operational energy for new buildings and also the embodied carbon. So the, the amount of energy and carbon that's needed to build those buildings, the, the building materials like concrete and steel and brick and things like that. So there's a lot that can be done. Um, I will make sure that Sarah and Spencer have that information. So if you're interested, you know, reaching out to them, activists can absolutely come to it too, but we're really trying to reach out to policymakers. And should we address questions at the end? Sarah? We have we have one question. Um, let's let's fit it in if you don't mind. Sure. Um, thank so, you. Pros and cons of leasing solar panels versus buying them outright. It is much better financially if you're going to be in your home for more than ten years to buy them outright. Um, if you lease them, the other person, the other party, gets to take advantage of those tax credits instead of you. Uh, usually what ends up happening when you lease your roof is you get about a 10% discount on your electricity and not more than that. Whereas if you buy them outright, once you pay them off, you get free electricity for like 15 years. And um, if they are put on in a tasteful way, and I will say that I have seen a lot of not tasteful solar, so it, it can be done in a bad way. If it's done tastefully um, and your real estate agent is educated, it does translate into sale price. So um, it's not necessarily just for you, but it, if you're gonna be selling the home before you could benefit all, get all those benefits out of it, it does translate to the next owner. So I generally encourage people to buy, even if they borrow for it. Um, as I said, it's often uh, cash flow positive anyway, um, but, Leasing is one way to do it without any upfront costs. And uh, tasteful, well, okay. If you have a roof that has lots of um, uh, like pipes going out, so say, you know, uh, vents and uh, skylights and stuff, sometimes a solar, solar installer will put it all like around all that and it's not very nice. I, I would say the most, nice looking ones I think are like in a rectangle or a square instead of just like haphazardly all over the roof. And then of course, um, I mean, I think tasteful, you have to use the side of the home that's most sunny. I've seen them on the front that can be really nicely done and it's it's tasteful, but I've also seen them not done. <laughs> so, uh, and it looks like, Somebody bought, so that's the other thing is leasing can make sale a little bit complicated because you're transferring a uh, relationship you have with the solar installer to a new owner. So it can be a little more complicated. It's not impossible or anything, but um, what I see Lily is saying that she's not seeing very much in terms of financial benefits by uh, doing the leasing the roof. It's still better than nothing, but you know, I, I guess I would encourage people to look into community solar and especially if you're income qualified because it's a much it's 20% off immediately and you don't have it on your roof and it's you can get out of it at any time. Can she Thank get out? No, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Well, you can buy it out. I guess you can buy it out. It's a 15 year lease. Oh yeah, I, it's not, once you're in, I wouldn't try and change anything. Thank you so much, Bev. That was so much good information. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our second speaker, 
Jane Carbone. Jane is the Director of Development at Homeowners Rehab, which is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. And she has over 30 years of experience producing affordable housing at HRI. During her tenure at the organization, she has participated in the growth of HRI's portfolio to over 1,400 units. She is responsible for managing HRI's development staff of project managers and overseeing their work from all aspects of the development process, pre-development through construction. She is a pioneer in incorporating sustainable and environmentally friendly building practices into their new developments, as well as the adoption of green, healthy renovation practices in the entire portfolio. Jane received her BA in environmental design and city planning from UMass Amherst and is a licensed construction supervisor and lead AP. All right, Jane, take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna quickly go through them. Next slide, as I talk. So a little bit HRI, we're, uh, as Sarah said, we're a housing nonprofit developer and I've been here for over 30 something years. Um, we, we range, our housing stock ranges from three unit buildings, wood frame, triple deckers to a 300 unit um, concrete structure, uh, 12 stories on Memorial Drive in Cambridge. So we have a very uh, strange mix of, of different housing types. And the majority of our housing is 100% affordable, mostly through the low income housing tax credit program. And we do have some mixed income developments as well. And we recently um, purchased a development in Worcester that we uh, did a, a housing renovation on there. And it, Worcester ha has a little bit of a different housing stock, but um, similar needs and, and a pretty a pretty high asthma rate, the, one of the highest asthma rates in the country. So we wanted to try to address that during our renovation. Next slide. So one of the things um, we've been trying to do over the years is, you know, in the late nineties, when we were doing our renovations, you know, I think we we're always focused on energy conservation. And so we would, you know, work with the Energy Star program we would um, incorporate recycling into our occupied rehab. So we would refinance a building, uh, borrow money to renovate it and normally do kitchens and bathrooms and new roofing, window siding, but we tried to focus on greening our specs. So incorporating, um, doing an energy audit when we do our capital needs assessment, look at what energy conservation measures we could do, the low hanging fruit, you know, incorporate, um, water sense fixtures and toilets to save water uh, and for he healthy indoor air quality, low VOC paints, no VOC paints. And, um, and then over the years, so that was sort of in the late nineties and the energy style was sort of the only program around and we would get some rebates. And then in the, the 2000s, we started really focusing on um, doing replacement boilers using high efficiency condensing boilers doing more water conservation measures, low flow aerators, shower heads, uh, toilets. And, and it's amazing, you know, how much, uh, how much you save just from identifying a leaky toilet or a, a dripping faucet. I mean, we pay a huge water rates and that's tied to our st uh, stormwater at, in Boston. Um, thank you to the Quabbin Reservoir, but um, those, those rates are, ex exorbitant. And so we really try to tackle reducing our water costs. And then looking at potential solar energy through solar domestic and uh, PV on our on our rooftops. And then in 2014, we, we and, and back in the early 2000s, we worked with the utility program. And there's a program through Mass Save uh, that's the lean program and that helps fund affordable housing developers to incorporate energy conservation measures and they fund those improvements. And so one of the things they want you to do is incorporate, have your building tracked because they, you know, the, the utility companies need to see that the measures that you're doing are actually 
reducing um, and they are conserving and they're saving money. So, and I think Massachusetts is has one of the most efficient and the highest in the country um, energy program through the through Mass Save. And so the lean program, we're able to um, collect data and when all of our buildings are in what is called WeGoWise, it's a software that tracks our electrical use, our gas use and our water consumption. And then, um, so once all our portfolio was in that, we could see where our high energy hogs were and then target those properties to do retrofits and do an energy audit with the utility company. And the overall goal is obviously to improve the, the health and wellness of the resident, but also reduce our operating expenses and then try to align with the city's carbon reduction goals. Um, so now what we're trying to do and what we've done in the past is try to see how can we look at our small buildings, achieve a high efficiency through net zero. And then more recently, we did a new construction project that we got Passive House certified with the support of Mass CEC and Beverly's program. Next slide. So this is just, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows the, the, stream, the extreme heat and how you know, heat waves due to climate change is, is gonna be more growing. There, there'll be more degree days over 90 degrees in, in, than typical in the past. And so I think we're trying to focus on you know, making our buildings as tight and, and try to address the existing housing stock and look at um, th this is talks about like all the heat islands that are in the Cambridge area and the darker surfaces where all the impervious pavement is and roofs and those areas that absorb heat that we're trying to identify and, and also incorporate you know the tree canopies and and bring as many the city of Cambridge has a pretty pretty um, stringent uh, ordinance on removing any trees on a on a public way and also on private land. So you, you can't just cut a tree down. There's a process for that. Next slide. So that this was a development, um, you see on the left, we had a fire, it's a, a three family building that had a fire in uh, 2009. And so we saw the opportunity to see if we could make this as close to net zero as possible. And so, the, you can see the building is right to, close to the, um, to the property line. And so we were trying to get the city to agree, we wanna put uh, additional insulation, we wanna put blow in insulation in the walls, but we also, also wanna add rigid on the outside to make the envelope tighter. And, and they actually would only allow, I think an inch because it was so close to the property line. And so this was another you know, policy change that we, try to enforce at the city because all these buildings when we're retrofitting would be the time to make these energy conservation improvements and don't constrain the owner from doing more insulation if there are, if there are issues within the footprint of the building. So since that time, they've actually expanded and given um, their zoning relief and there's a green ordinance now that you can add additional insulation. We also had historical issues um, here because it was a historic building. And so, you know, we had to go in front of the store commission to get the additional insulation approved around the windows and the sills and make sure that they, they um, approve that. And then we were, so we we're able to get our 19 in the walls. We did additional insulation in the roof and then we put solar PV and solar thermal. Um, so the next slide. So we, we definitely reduce our utility costs on this development. Next slide. And the same with another development, um, a six unit building that in, had a, another fire and we saw an opportunity to do a deeper energy retrofit here. And, um, and so we did this, so use the same principles. Again, it was a historic building, um, but we were able to put on the two inches of insulation now because we had relief from the previous policy change so we added two inches of rigid on the ins on the exterior with the rain screen, and then we did the solar PV on the roof with um, all energy efficient lighting and appliances. And this got um, LEED certified platinum. So LEED was the criteria that we used, but um, now we have gone to a, a, a more beneficial criteria called Enterprise Green Communities, which is, it really focuses not only on the envelope, but it really focuses on the 
mechanical systems to get that efficiency that you need to get tighter buildings and also health and wellness um, requirements for residents improvements to indoor air quality. Next slide. So all of our properties um, are carpet free now. You know, years ago, there, uh, when I was doing a occupied rehab, we went up to, we we're trying to figure out how we were gonna recycle on site for wood, pro, uh, paper, cardboard. And we went up to this facility in Worcester that was just starting the, um, to separate all their materials. And the, the equipment broke down for the day. And it was astounding how much carpet was there at that landfill. It was the, it was the size of uh, Mount Wachusett. I mean, it was pretty significant, the amount of carpet in one day that was on the, at the landfill. So from that moment on, it sort of seared in my brain um, you know, that we had to do more when we do renovations. And so we, we eliminate carpet in our portfolio as well, you know, for that reason and also to reduce allergens. Um, this was a, an infill project that we did that was all electric. Here we said the other developments were, we were using um, high efficiency condensing boilers. Here we said, let's go all electric. There was not a gas line at the street. And so we wanted to see what our savings were here. And these are the air source heat pumps and we have PV on the, on the roof. And uh, again, this is LEED Platinum, but with enterprise green communities. And we have a white roof to, to eliminate the heat island. Um, stormwater management, you know, the city has pretty strict requirements on how stormwater is to be designed on the site and incorporated on the site before it can go into the system, the city system. So we, this is only an eight unit building. So we had a dry well that we had to catch roof water to dissipate slowly into the system. Um, but here we have a 50% savings in heat in our in a carbon emission reduction. And so again, we're tracking all this and our WeGo wise. And any anytime we get a spike every month, we'll get a report that shows, and then we send our property manager out to see, you know, is there a leaking toilet or is somebody running some electric um, to try to identify where the where the spike is. Next slide. Next slide, Gabby. So this is, you can see the carbon output um, for three Brookline Place. So the, the orange line is, um, all of these are affordable housing. The question is um, from Becca, all of these are 100% affordable developments. Um, so you can see the orange line is a standard benchmark uh, multifamily building in Massachusetts. And then you can see how well the three Brookline place is performing in terms of BTUs per square foot. So 34 kilowatts versus a 58. And all tenants pay 30% of their income. Um, that's the minimum. Next slide. So we took a leap. Um, Last two years ago, there was a parcel of land that was vacant. And so I wanted to you know, continue our progress on getting to net zero in a larger development. And this is a, was the largest affordable housing development in Cambridge in 40 years. It's 98 units. And so we were incorporating a lot Cambridge incorporated the stretch code in Massachusetts um, long before you know it was the the code, and so the stretch code has a lot more energy conservation measures that you have to achieve in terms of um, mechanical systems and insulation. And so, because we're doing that, the the design was becoming very efficient, and we wanted to also incorporate solar um, PV. And the city had a very stringent, um, this is not in the flood zone, but the city had a very strict policy in this neighborhood as to how stormwater gets collected on the site. And so we put this all together and um, Bev was actually you know, working at Mass CEC. And so we were calling the project, you know, we were a stealth passive house because we were using a lot of the same methods and materials, but, um, getting the building envelope as tight as possible and introducing mechanical ventilation for fresh air and um, reducing the electric costs, the um, 
gas consumption and trying to eliminate gas. So we were, we were calling ourselves Stealth Passive House. And then while Bev was at Mass CEC, she created this Passive House um, pilot program. So we were able to then apply for funding and we were, we were in construction actually, or just starting construction. And then we made some minor changes um, to some of the drawings, mostly the HVAC system that got us into Passive House and we were, we were able to get certified. So this was completed um, last July during COVID, which was a really challenging time where construction was pretty much shut down, but we we're able to, after a two and a half month shutdown, um, get the building occupied in July and August. So next slide. So this is all 100% affordable under the tax credit program. So, and we also, our developments where we, this is also FitWell certified. So it's another, you know, we try to incorporate health and wellness in our developments. So to make it one, a, a more pleasant place for residents to live, but more user-friendly for residents and also promote health and wellness um, in the space. So we have a lot of signage that encourages people to take the stairs. We designed the, the staircase to be one of the first entry points uh, instead of the elevator lobby. You know, people look at the stairs and can climb the stairs versus taking the elevator. We have um, the low flow um, toilets and fixtures and we have the um, comfort height toilets, which is now becoming more of a standard. Um, we work with a local artist to create a more organic play structure in the backyard. Um, this is all accessible, fully accessible, and five units are um, ADA compliant, and we have two units for visual uh, and hearing impaired. So we have, and we have automatic door openers. We use a lot with contrasting colors. Um, again, for you know, aging in place residents. Next slide. So just some of the specifics, um, you know, it's a defensible ground floor. It's a podium style project where the parking is at grade and the management office. So there's no living space at the first floor. It's all um, management or parking. And um, the community room is located on the top story. That's a place where people can go. We have it tied to the generator so that if there's an issue with, um, there's a, a climate, if there's a storm event, people can go to that space and they'll, they'll be power for you know several hours with the generator. And everything is um, resilient to all the materials that we're using are resilient. Next slide. So you can see the podium style parking on the left. And this was a community room that was under construction. And also for the landscaping, we had to incorporate um, a, pavers, um, uh, asphalt, permeable asphalt paving. And um, we had to put in a system in the ground that collected in the event of a, um, a storm, the city required us to, and this is part of their resiliency measures to collect um, not just storm water from the roof, but uh, waste water, uh, waste from toilets and dishwashers. And so we have an 8,000 gallon tank and that um, the city, it's controlled by a telemetry system. So when there's a storm event and the city says, our system is gonna be full, we want you to collect your own wastewater and stormwater. Um, and they will tell us after the end of the storm event to release it into the, into the, um, the sanitary systems that are separated. Next slide. So this is how, you know, it really, it's, it takes a, a group of skilled contractors and they're really artists, you know, I think uh, we had a learning curve initially on how to, how to build Passive House, but I think, you know, in the end, they, they learned that it was just a tight envelope, you know, you, you had to wrap carefully all the penetrations, you had to install insulation and don't leave any gaps. Um, and so we, we really had, uh, we had toolbox sessions at every every week with the different trades so that they understood exactly what they were doing and um, and they really you know bought into it. So it's two by six wall cavity with blown in um, fiberglass. Uh, it's mineral wool on the inside and then we have the rigid on the exterior and then we have the Seager wrap that is the air barrier. Um, and then we have two ERVs and 
the VRFs for that's for heating and cooling. And then the 100, um, the 100 kilowatt solar PV is for the common area electric. And then we could not find an efficient domestic hot water that was electric at the time. So that is the only gas, um, the gas appliance on the development. And every unit is compartmentalized so that, you know, the goal is to not hear or um, smell what the, your neighbor is cooking and there's uh, active ventilation in every room, not just in the kitchens and baths. Next slide. And then the passive house windows are triple glazed and it's very quiet. It's a busy street, but it's very quiet. So the benefits, you know, you know, we see for, for us and for getting to meet the city's climate goals, you know, passive house is really one of the, one of the most important things in, in, in looking at not just the existing building stock, but new construction. I mean, there are projects now in development that are going to be passive house that are existing buildings. And I, at the Nessie conference two weeks ago, I listened to a presentation. There's a historic structure in Fitchburg. So they're they're getting the National Park Service to approve a passive house window for historic, which is, you know, going to be a great opportunity for other people that have similar issues with with projects. But um, so so passive house, I think, is really one of for us is really one of the primary drivers for us to develop uh, affordable housing and make it um, resilient and re work with the cities to meet their climate goals. And residents, you know, next slide. Um, so this is a picture of the outside. Um, when we, we did one of the things with the, the passive house grant that we got, we had to track the construction costs. And, you know, as I said, we were close to stretch code, but and so our construction costs were around one and a half percent, but I think the average cost is three around three percent just on you know first cost for materials. But then you look at the durability of some of these materials, and um, you know that extends the life of you know many of these products. Next slide. So we have um, we also have so this is the lobby. You can see the the stairway is opened. And there's the elevator behind the doors. And then we tried to just create, again, this is family housing. We have a lot of children here. So we tried to create like more playful uh, elements in the lobby and, and incorporate um, also natural elements with the wood ceiling. Next slide. And this is on the, the community room on the top floor. So the, this is um, uh, the kitchen area and and also an area to have events. We have a huge patio outside and we have um, a lounge area. Unfortunately, all of this um, has been closed during COVID, but we did, if you see these two um, little small spaces in the back on the top right-hand side, there are blue walls in the back. We added those, they're, they're quiet study rooms. And so we added those um, because I, I've, Oftentimes, you know, when you're in a household, you have a lot of kids and there's a lot of noise and um, sometimes kids can't, you know, study. So we decided to add these because the lounge was looked a little bit more spacious. And then, and so we added these spaces, which became really important during COVID because some of the families could have their children, you know, do their schoolwork from here. And then some parents signed in to use those spaces. So it became a great amenity during the, the pandemic. Next slide. And this is a porch area, the patio area that we have programmed. You know, we will have health and wellness um, activities out here, crafts, and we'll get a garden club started here with residents. Next slide. And this is our solar. Um, right now, we're trying to track our solar. We've, we had some issues initially with the install, so we're trying to work the kinks out. But um, but we're still seeing our seeing savings. But the solar for the common air is not. 100% up and running yet. Next slide. This is the exterior at night. And so we have a small space in the front on the on the street and then the back area is where the pocket park is. And we have reduced parking and we have spaces, it's 98 units. We have park bike parking for 115 bikes. Next slide. So this is uh, the AOA project I was talking about. This is our 300 unit development and we're putting on an exterior cladding and, redo and replacing the windows here just because this building has continually um, 
leaked in the past over the since 19 since it was built really and so now we're trying to put this envelope around this um, exterior so if you're ever in Cambridge on Memorial Drive you'll see um, over the next two years the renovation here next slide and so um, passive house Bev who runs the program you know that some of the some some of the Incentives are they'll provide 100% of the feasibility study up to $5,000 to determine whether you know you you're eligible to go passive house or if you want to go passive house and then 75% of the modeling I mean we up to 20,000 so you have to have a passive house certifier and there are some um, additional soft costs to to the passive house um, getting certified and then $3,000 per unit for passive house certification so you know on a 98 unit building, that's not a small amount of money. And, you know, once we subtracted all of the, you know, we added the costs and then we subtracted all the incentives, it was pretty nominal for us to, you know, pursue certification. And this is for five units and above new construction. Next slide. So um, since the program was at Mass CEC and a credit to Bev for really promoting this. Um, you can see 2020, I think that was Finch, the first project. And then you can see in 2021, 21 projects now are in the pipeline, 2022, 41 projects in the pipeline. So I think, um, you know, people are taking and communities are taking advantage of Passive House and the incentives and now Mass, um, Mass Save is actually in um, incorporating Passive House as part of their plan. So they are picking up this um, program, which is great. And there are more programs under the three-year plan that we're trying to also get incorporated, like the air source heat pumps, and you know that the utilities have kind of run out of you know replacing light bulbs and and weather stripping. And now we're trying to lobby and folks should also lobby to try to get more improvements uh, to the next level to get us to more electrification in our uh, communities and away from carbon. Next slide. And that's it. So um, I'll pass it along to Sarah who can introduce Spencer, but is there, do we have time for a question or we just wanna go back at the end. You, well, you answered some during the presentation, but um, I'll just say if you do have more questions for Jane, you can uh, ask her in the breakout rooms, which will be after Spencer's presentation. Thank you so much, Jane. That was, I'm always so impressed at the work that HRI is doing. Thank you. Um, all right, now I'm going to in, uh, introduce our third speaker, Spencer Shorkey. Spencer is a PhD student at UMass Amherst. In 2018, he and another PhD student put their grad stipends together and got a loan on a house with the intention of converting to clean energy. Rooftop solar was installed in 2019 and geothermal heat pump in 2020. Without much money saved or large incomes, these projects were feasible thanks to savings in utility costs and incentive programs. Implementing clean energy can result in a more economical living situation for homeowners, which is relevant in our current affordable housing crisis. Spencer is going to present a cost benefit analysis of clean energy implementation alongside his personal experience and real data as a homeowner doing so. All right. Over to you, Spencer. Thanks, Sarah, for the intro. And I just have to say that the Passive House work by Jane and Beverly is absolutely amazing. I'm really happy that you guys are doing that work. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how clean energy can save your, you money if you're a homeowner. And uh, next slide. So the main technologies that you can implement as a homeowner are solar and battery for producing your own energy and being your own utility. And also in the Northeast, we need a lot of heating and a little bit of cooling. So heat pump technology like Beverly and Jane talked about a little bit. I personally, I feel ground source heat pump is a way to go. It's more economical in the long run, especially if you're a homeowner, you probably have a yard. So it's easier to 
get enough space to do the geothermal work. And also in the grand scheme of things, the highest power demand in the future is going to be on the coldest days and the hottest days. And geothermal will be substantially more efficient than air source heat pump on the coldest days and the hottest days. So when it comes to peak capacity, like I think geothermal is the way to go and we should really be pushing for that as much as possible. Uh, next slide. So just to put this out front, this is what the economic picture looks like in, in my situation for what I've installed. So for my geothermal heat pump, I replaced an existing oil system and the cost benefit analysis I have here is based on real data from how much it costs for oil over the 2019-2020 winter and how much I ended up paying for geothermal energy in the 2020-21 winter because I could actually track the energy use in my geothermal system. And so based on after with all incentives and analysis included, the payoff period is about 10 years for my system. And for the solar, my payoff period will be around six years. And I did the analysis in different ways because it's just simpler to calculate the value of energy versus the cost of heating. But yeah, this is what it's going to look like. And after that payback period, my utilities are going to be three or $4,000 less expensive. So that comes out to up almost $300 a month. So that's not, not small numbers. Next slide. All right, so there's a lot of numbers in this slide. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanted them to be there in case someone wants to look into more detail. I'm comparing my installation in 2019 to uh, what Energy Sage, the numbers Energy Sage provided for a typical install. And there's a couple incentives that are available, the Massachusetts tax incentive and the federal tax incentive. And uh, well, the, mass, the federal tax incentive it may take a few years for you to get all of your income for it, you to get it back on your income tax. So that's something you should consider. But just to make things easier, I'm comparing directly the cost after all the incentives are accounted for. So for example, I had my solar installed, but, um, and I've got that money back. Basically I didn't pay federal income tax the last two years. I got all the money back because I have about $8,000 in incentives for that and did not have pay that much in taxes before tax day. So uh, after incentives though, my project was around 20K and for a typical installation, the price has actually dropped even more in the last couple of years. So it's coming around like 12K to 17K. And there was another program, the Mass Solar Loan Program, which ended in 2020 that I also used. I didn't account for it in here, but that actually made my payoff period a bit better. I just, to compare to the current situation, didn't include that incentive. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And so how you get paid back is there's a SMART program, which basically for every kilowatt hour you generate from your solar panels, they're just gonna give you, uh, mine turned out to be eight, 8.3 cents per kilowatt hour they pay me, in addition to the power offsets on my meter that I produce because it's net metered. And there's something else involved in the SMART program now, and that's batteries. So the batteries, distributed energy storage is gonna be really important in the future as um, we need to like store some energy and release it over time to balance out the renewables in our system. And SMART is going to pay you for that. And it's actually a pretty sweet deal. So your rate adder would be another six cents per kilowatt hour. And you would also get around 13, 1400 annually for a, a reasonable system just to access your power during peak demand periods in the winter and summer. And I didn't, this program wasn't available when I was installing my system. So I didn't get the battery. Um, but I recommend if anyone is looking into it, this is the way to go. And I'll show the analysis on how much better the payback is. And interestingly, you can use the heat loan to pay for it. And so it's kind of a no brainer. You should do that. The economics are great. Next slide. Okay, so down here on the, the bottom 
row of that table shows the total annual payoff for my system. It's around 3000 per year. It's a bit bigger than the average system, which would come in at about 2500 per year. And then for the average system with a battery, it's substantially higher, like 4500 per year. And on the chart on the right, I'm just showing the value of energy return. And so for all the systems, the positive return is around six years. But for the battery, you can see like over time, your return is going to be much higher. And yeah, so that, that can save you a lot of money. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's all these, all these programs that MassSafe has. Some of them are linked. So I recommend if you can get the, I think we're going to upload the PDF of the slides and I have loads of links in here for stuff that was helpful for me. Um, so for geothermal, and again, I advocate for the geothermal heat pumps over air source heat pumps for residential because of the, the long-term payoff is better. So you're, you're, you don't actually don't need that much land. Like I, my lot is a half acre lot. And I think I probably could have put, there's enough, I think you probably could have done it with a half as half that much space. And so we had vertical holes board and around uh, 200 meter holes, two 300 foot holes bored into the earth. And then some fluid will pass through those, through this, this piping and into a heat pump, which is going to extract heat from the earth or put heat into the earth, depending on if you're heating or cooling your house. Next slide. And so the geothermal was not as streamlined to do as a solar. Solar has been around for a while and solar contractors really have it down. They'll do all the incentive applications for you really fast and present all the analysis, the cost benefit analysis for Geothermal is trickier. There's, there's rebate programs. So I used a mass CEC rebate program. Now that's no longer available. It's transitioned to a mass save rebate, which isn't as much. And uh, oh, so I'm comparing my installation to an installation by a new company called Dandelion Geothermal. They're not currently operating in this area, so I couldn't use them, but they're substantially less expensive in their installation cost. And I know that they will be starting operations in this area soon. So I really recommend everyone takes a look at them because it's the economic payoff for their system is great. As you can see, all the way over on the, on the right, an equivalent system installed by Dandelion, even with lower amounts of incentives is cheaper than my, than my system was. So it's kind of a no brainer to look at this company if you're gonna do geothermal. And not to mention, it's gonna be much simpler to do the installation because um, I, had to, I had to wrangle up a drilling contractor and a heat pump installer and get them to work together for this project. Whereas Dandelion is like fully integrated. They have, they do everything under one, one operation. And so the mass rebate for a three ton system and it was income based for me. So I got $11,000 for a three ton system. You get 6K through the mass save rebate now. Alternative energy credits, ah, this is a, this is a tough one. So back when I was planning out the system, they would have been worth around $7,000, which uh, would have made my payback a bit better. But then COVID happened and um, basically these credits are sold to industry. And so the demand cratered and so now the most I can get for them is around 3000, but hopefully they'll rebound and then that'll be a much nicer incentive. Um, I'm still working on getting mine sold. And so that kind of speaks to how this process is a little bit more complicated. And then there's the mass tax incentive, the federal tax incentive. And yeah, so here's the cost after all the incentives. Uh, next slide. All right, so how did I get my numbers of the geothermal system being cheaper than the oil? Uh, I got oil automatically delivered each month in the winter of 2019, 2020. So this isn't like a perfect analysis because they might've delivered more or less. But basically over the whole winter, I used uh, close to $3,000 worth of oil and $1,500 in electric. 
And it's notable, I calculated based on using just grid electricity, but if you're using your own solar power, it would be substantially cheaper. And not to mention this only accounts for heating. I didn't really have a good way to compare the cost for air conditioning because I'd never metered my wall air conditioners, but that would make it even more, even cheaper. It's about twice as efficient as standard wall air conditioners. And my data suggested that geothermal has a 43% lower cost of operation and Dan Lyon, pretty big company that does pretty good stats on their website says 47% lower operating costs, including AC. And so that pretty much lines up with what I observed with my system. Next slide. And so I'm gonna compare the Dandelion system because I have to say, wait, I kinda wanna say wait until they come into town later this year and maybe set up their own location in mass in the future because their economics, their technology is just so much better and optimized for doing geothermal heat pump. Whereas if you have to bring in a drilling contractor, their equipment is optimized for drilling for water wells and they basically just will do geothermal because you beg them to do it. <laughs> and then you have to convince a, a, a heat pump contractor to come in and do that system too. And, then, and so uh, the payback, anyways, Dan Alliance payback is better. So it just makes a lot of sense to go with them. Uh, in one of my next slides, there's a link and I suggest like everyone just sign up for their wait list. I really think that they should come up here to Western Mass and set up shop because there's a, you know, Greenfield is right on 91 and Route 2. You can go in a lot of directions, service a big area. So I hope they can come to town. With the Dandelion system, the payback is within four years compared to a new oil system. If you're going to compare to an existing oil system, it would be around 10 to 15 years. Great thing about, uh, I, I don't know anyone that works for Dandelion Geothermal, but I did talk to them and verify a lot of this information. So I'm not like plugging their company as a personal connection. Again, I had a different system installed, but I just think their company is fantastic. Anyways, they have 0% down financing, which basically mitigates the payback period for you and lets you see returns immediately. And then for the solar, the payback period is around six years. And again, with the battery, it's much better. So if, if I were doing it over again right now, I would say I would use a heat loan to install a battery with the, with the solar panels and get that all financed like uh, pretty nicely. And then contact Dandelion. And when the time comes in a year or so, when they're setting up shop in town, they can uh, provide the financing for you to have an installation done at your house. And some other factors that I don't think I mentioned before, but I should have is you need an existing HVAC system for uh, the geothermal installation because it, it, it blows hot air, basically, is how it works. And I think that's, oh, and there's many other fringe benefits to these systems too. If you got the battery and the solar, if the power goes out, you're you're set, you can run all your appliances and not worry too much about things uh, getting shut down at an inopportune time. And with the geothermal, you know, I have to say it's really nice not to have a smelly oil tank in my basement and not to have something being lit on fire periodically inside of my house. <laughs> so yeah, and there's environmental health benefits too, obviously, but I'm just focusing on, on the economics here. So next slide. So that's it. Um, I, I think you guys should sign up on Dandelion's waitlist here. And on the PDF of my presentation, there's another slide that has a whole array of links for all of these, uh, for considering all of these alternative energy technologies. And I think, I guess I'll, Sarah, I'll, I'll just answer the questions in the chat right now, if that sounds good. Sure. Okay, so minimum lot size that you need to, okay, so I think Dandel, for my system, there's a few factors, so the, there has to be a certain distance away from power lines, so it's not just the lot size, because they have to move, they have to basically tilt this enormous rig 
up vertically. And Dandelion has better systems that are optimized for doing geothermal where they can basically drill a well wherever so they don't have that issue. And so the lot size for them would, you know, I, I can't say for sure, but based on my experience, I think quarter acre should be enough for like a 2000 square foot house because you need uh, around one well per thousand square feet and uh, each well has to be 20 feet away from each other to avoid uh, um, the issue of actually cooling down the earth too much. So one other question. If one already has solar, is it not possible to get a battery? Beverly, you can answer that one? Yeah, so like in urban areas, you can actually go down instead of, so your setup is fairly horizontal. You can go down more too. So you don't need much land at all. <laughs> but it, there's trade-offs in cost, right? I think the more you have to go down, the more expensive it is, especially if there's bedrock, so. Ah, uh, yeah, so here's another point that I'm gonna plug Dandelion again. So with my system, I ran into, ended up being a little bit more expensive because it becomes, basically you drill through dirt and then you hit bedrock. And once you hit bedrock, you no longer have to put this like support structure into the hole to prevent it from caving in. And that support structure costs money and ended up costing around five grand more for me because it was a hundred feet deeper to hit bedrock than they expected it to be. And they left that in the ground and it didn't get to be reused. And that's just how their system was optimized versus dandelion. They can actually reuse that. And so theoretically, if I had gone with dandelion, I wouldn't have ended up going $5,000 over budget because of that issue. Um, the question about solar and a battery. For some reason, I think it's now possible to use the heat loan incentive for, for getting a battery added on to your existing PV system. And uh, that's not an option for me because I use the heat loan for geothermal. But Beverly, can you confirm that? Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know the details, but if you reach out about a heat loan, you can find out what all the eligible things are, but I think battery storage is one of the things. Yeah. Great, so let's set up the breakout rooms now. Um, unfortunately, I think we'll only have about 10 minutes um, just to respect everyone's time. We'll spend about 10 minutes in the breakout rooms and then um, uh, come back to the main group. So, um, you should uh, see options on your screen to choose a breakout room and just click on the room you want and you will join that group and we'll bring everyone back together um, in about 10 minutes. I didn't see an option. If you just click on the thing that says breakout rooms in the bar on the bottom of your screen, there should be three options and you can click join. I may, I, I, I don't see it. No worries, if you're having tech problems, I can add you in. So I can do that for you, Spencer. Okay, thanks. Um, we therefore uh, use the stretch code. So your question, Michael Passarini, you find out if your town is already a stretch code town, because if it is, the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the building codes are much better, much better than if you, uh, if you were in a town that's not yet uh, a Green Communities Act town. Cambridge has been a Green Communities Act town for a long time. And Greenfield was one of the first, maybe the first green community in the state. Appropriately so, enough. But I would like to hear, that's very good to know. Thanks, uh, Pamela. I would like to hear Beverly's response though. So I would say there, there definitely will be a net zero stretch code. It may not be defined exactly as all the people who think who, who work to pass that law think, 
And I would say that is why you should send your municipal representatives to this built environment plus uh, forum that I was talking about, about zero energy buildings uh, on June 11th, because the devil is in the details with the stretch code. Um, and it doesn't automatically get added. So Greenfield's going to have to approve the new code once it's put in place. So there still is like political will that has to be done. It doesn't automatically happen. So, and then that of course is for new buildings, right? And what I would say about the quality question that, that Michael was saying is I personally think standards like Passive House are very helpful for durability. So uh, when I worked with Jane, we would have buildings come for refinance every 15 or 30 years that are affordable housing to redo the baths and kitchens, right? And so many times my colleagues at other places and even at HRI, we'd go in to redo the baths and kitchens and find there was a wall problem. So sometimes sheathing was rotting or there was mold and insulation. And that's because there weren't enough eyes on the building science. One of the things I like about Passive House is that you have a third party certifier who's looking at well, first, when the plans are developed, they look and see, you know, they, they ask questions on top of your regular green consultant say, is this air barrier uh, where it should be? Like, is it is the vapor going to condense here and create a mold problem? So you have an extra pair of eyes. And then per perhaps even more important is Passive House has protocols for testing all the way through the construction process to make sure that the way the plans are put together are actually built. And they run a blower door to see how, how the air infiltration is all the way along. And so if a plumber forgets to, you know, they put a hole through for their pipe and they don't seal it up, when they test the next day, they say, what happened to the numbers? And they go back and they find what was wrong and they, you know, they get the guy, the person who is doing that to do it the right way for the rest of the, and honestly, when people's uh, performance is um, tested and people are getting measured, they do a better job building, they do. So um, I, I like Passive House because of that. The, the stretch, net zero stretch code, Passive will be one of the options, I'm sure. And so the more you can encourage that on a local level to be talked up, the better, I think. And Passive's a great fit for anything like five units or above. Um, there's a new standard for single family. I'm not sure if it's gonna be inexpensive enough to make it worth it. But uh, that's potentially an option too. And I apologize, I need to leave. But, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, thank everyone thank for the time. Thank you um, to our speakers, Beverly Craig, Jane Carbone, and Spencer Shorkey. Thank you, Gabby Perry, for your technical assistance. Um, and we encourage you all to stay involved. Um, in the follow-up to the forum. Um, thanks again and have a great night. Thanks so much. And I love Greenfield. It's a great place. It is. Yeah. I love Greenfield too. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank bye. you.